Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, bonus seminar for the School of Applied Sciences. My name is Dr Chris Watkins, I'm a senior lecturer in psychology, here to, um, here to introduce today's speaker, uh, Chris Duncan. Uh, thanks first and foremost uh, to Ken Ray from Coach Logic for putting me in touch with Chris. Um, and as usual, if you have any questions, you can post them um, in the Q&A section in the top right hand corner. Uh, we should have around about 15 minutes or so um, at the end of the session for any questions that you may have. OK, so to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Chris Duncan is a former um, international hockey player for Scotland. Um, he's the current director of hockey at the Edinburgh Academy and coach for the Scotland under 16 hockey team. Um, he's also currently completing a PhD um, in coaching. Um, his talk today is called My Relationship with Failure in Academia and Sports, um, and he will discuss some of his work and his experience and his thoughts on these issues. So it's a great pleasure to, to have him here today to, to speak to you all. Uh, so I'll hand you over to Chris just now. Thanks, Chris. Hey, morning. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, uh, for having me on. It's lovely to be here. Um, as is the way with 2020, I am stuck at home. My kitchen is currently being ripped out uh, and it could be a bit noisy. So apologies if you do hear any noise in the background. Do just stop me uh, in my tracks <laughs> and we'll allow the, the noise to pass. So um, Chris asked me to speak a little bit with uh, about my relationship with failure. Um, both within academia and within sports. So the way that I, I've looked at today is um, to take the opportunity to kind of profile my background and um, have a little bit of a discussion around the things that have led to kind of where I am and the way that I would operate today. Um, so oh, I'm having some slide issues. So um, plan for today, just a little introduction to myself and um, my own relationship with failure and how that's actually impacted what I would do day to day. Uh, a little discussion around what failure is and I think this is a bit of a taboo topic that people look at failure as a real setback and a negative but I think if we if we plan for it and if we manage it and we really think about how we're utilizing it and it's programmed in effectively then it could be really used as a massive learning opportunity. So my background um, Chris introduced me uh, about that so yeah I um, played international hockey up until 2016 uh, at that stage I moved into coaching and um, whilst uh, I was doing that I became the director of hockey at Edinburgh Academy at a school here in Edinburgh uh, I was working with the Scotland under 16 boys team uh, latterly and more recently for the last two years I've been working with the, uh, the Scotland senior women's side as an assistant coach uh, which culminated in a, a European B Division gold medal last summer, which moves us into the A Division, so the, the top tier in Europe for, for next summer, if that were, hopefully were to go ahead. Um, and I think that my journey from where I began as a pupil at school, which is where I'm going to begin and actually end up now to look back and reflect on, is really quite interesting um, and certainly not as linear as I might have expected as a youngster. So my own relationship with failure um, be began a long time ago and I always often go back working in a school environment to talk to people about how I found my time at school and then um, I think that many always assume that anyone who is working in education or as an educator in a school environment or beyond has actually had a really positive experience with academia um, and mine was certainly the complete opposite and, and I love telling this story now because it's so good to be able to you know understand what peoples are going through and also to try and relate to them so and um, three years ago I, I told a story at a school assembly and it was one I had never told actually until that stage um, but every year there is uh, emails that go out from staff who organize the assemblies at a school asking if anyone will volunteer to speak now my initial response to all of them was to speed delete and go absolutely nowhere near it because I never wanted to get up in front of 600 people and talk. But one day I decided to bite the bullet because it's very much my turn. And um, I decided that actually the best thing to talk about would be failure. And, you know, I, I think we all understand that anyone tuning into this and anyone who has, you know, been through life, that we have numerous setbacks as part of our journey. And it is just what happens day to day. And it's not the, the result of failure, which actually defines us more our response to that. So, I very much have had those issues uh, day to day in the classroom, on the sporting field, at home, at work. Um, I've failed regularly, but I now look at it as, as one of the most powerful and positive learning opportunities. Um, so 
back in uh, my school days, I left school in 2008, age, uh, age 17, uh, 29 now. So um, I'm very fortunate to work at the school that I actually attended uh, for secondary school. And uh, I suppose quite a poignant part for me was my experience with that school. So um, I didn't really try at school. And I think others are, are pretty, probably quite similar. Uh, I kind of coasted by, tried to do the minimum amount of work possible uh, that was required to get by and, and all my focus points lay towards my time with sport. Uh, sport was definitely the, the highlight of my week, the highlight of my life. I tried my best to, to pass all my energy onto sport and my development within that as a player. I was very ambitious in terms of what I wanted to achieve. I was very fortunate to do so, um, but definitely my academic grades would suffer and um, not understanding that at the time, not really having a very pragmatic outlook. I had uh, assumed it because I was really good at dedicating my time to sport that I would just get good grades. Um, little did I know that that definitely wasn't the right approach. So uh, at my school at that point, we actually worked by an English curriculum. So we did GCSEs in S4, hires in S5 and then A levels in S6. So it was, it was quite a strange system. Um, but you know, because sport came pretty naturally to me, I was a bit naive on the work front. So I, I didn't do much work for my GCSEs. Uh, ended up doing okay, picked up a decent set of grades and then moved through into the higher year, which obviously, as most people will know, is the one which carries the most stigma in the Scottish education system. And there's a lot of pressure put on a good set of hires. Um, but me doing well in my GCSEs was probably the worst thing that could have happened to me um, because I thought, ah, oh, I'm bulletproof. Uh, I don't need to do much work. Uh, and I'm intelligent enough to get by. Um, and that definitely wasn't the case. So Monday the 6th of August 2007, and, and I remember it really well, uh, I woke up, uh, didn't really have much thought about my results, knowing it was results day, everyone else being in a bit of a panic, especially my mum and dad in the house. Uh, and it was 11 a.m. I heard a big thud on the porch. Um, walked to the door, picked up the envelope, a large big A4 white envelope from the SQA, opened up, slid out the papers, still hadn't really gathered what was about to happen and uh, read down the list. So uh, English, no award, French, no award, German, no award, business management, no award. And um, immediately sat in shock, searching for answers, uh, blamed the markers, blamed my teachers, um, blamed my parents, pretty much everybody, apart from actually looking inwards and to myself. And I think as a 17 year old, that's quite a challenging thing to do. You know, I really couldn't believe it. And I went into school that next uh, day to have a, a conversation with the director of studies. Now, my parents paid for my education in the, in the senior school and I had really very much let them down and he made that exceptionally clear to me, but he also made it very clear that actually no one was in charge of your own future other than yourself. No one could actually turn your life around from an academic perspective other than yourself. And um, if I wanted to go to university, if I wanted to progress, uh, if I wanted to move forward and have a successful kind of career off the back of it, then it had to come from me. And I think my commitment to sport and um, that I'd kind of set that goal of playing for my country, I would never miss a session. I would probably do extra work. Uh, definitely never had translated in to success from an academic perspective. So I think once that started to come a bit clearer and was spelled out to me, I really started to blame myself. Probably the most positive thing that I could have done at that stage that no one else actually had the power to make me work. So I went back to school on, on the first day of my S6 year uh, with one qualification from that year. I got C in AS level design technology, uh, something which I would, I'm not even sure why I picked to be honest. Uh, everybody spoke about the results and uh, the natural conversations go to how did you get on? Uh, I was so embarrassed that I actually lied, told nobody, probably for the best part of about eight years, never came clean to people that actually that's how I had done, but I got down to work. Uh, knew what I needed results wise, moved on, learnt through sport and was able to kind of work out how I would plan my days from a sporting perspective and turn that into a planned attack in terms of how I would manage my sport, uh, sorry, my academic work. So I um, managed to get what I needed out that year, got a place at university, four years later graduated, um, studied an MSc in sports coaching and performance at Inver Uni and distance learning and then uh, three years ago began a PhD. Now if I look uh, if I look at that journey that's taken me there, it was certainly not linear. It was certainly not what I would have planned it to. It was certainly an awful lot more bumpy a road than I would have liked it to be. But I think the key thing is that it's probably taught me so much more and uh, I'm almost pretty happy I went through that process because I feel in a much more comfortable place now at age 29 with myself and with my approach to what I do day to day because of 
of why this happened. And, and I think that having found topics that I was genuinely passionate about and interested in, um, I learned how to apply myself. But a lot of people ask me the question, does it matter that it took you so long to realise this? Do you not wish you'd realise this as a 14 year old? Well, no, not really, not now. I, I think if you'd asked me at age 20, 21, yeah, I would have said yes. But at the end of the day, we've got to where we want to go and how we get there is very much an individual pursuit. So it's um, it's about today is very much about actually what, what did that experience teach me and why has that impacted on my life day to day and certainly what I do from a coaching perspective and, and I hope that I can bring some context to it that will help you or, or even provide some stimulating conversation for you. So I think the first thing to look at is you know what is failure and I mentioned at the start we talk about it is a bit of a taboo word and a taboo phrase that everyone thinks it's the end of the world. Everyone thinks that it is absolutely when we have not achieved anything. But there's a difference between failure at the end of a process or failure as part of a process. And I think one of the first things I have now started to do is understand how people feel. So um, I run coaching sessions every day from, from people at age eight all the way up to people who are senior internationals uh, with hundreds of cats. And it's about putting yourself in the eye of the learner um, and actually understanding how people feel in their sessions. So on the screen here, uh, and you'll be able to try it if you'd like to on a bit of paper, if you split your bit of paper into four quadrants uh, and in the top left corner, if you sign your name with your dominant hand, okay, it's going to feel very, very easy, very, very simple. Um, it really isn't a challenge whatsoever. And then in the top right corner, if you then sign your name with your non, dominant hand. It's going to feel like a bit more of a challenge. You'll see from mine that it looks a bit like child's writing. Um, and then in the bottom left, you go back to your dominant hand. And as you are signing your name, you need to tap, tap on the table, tap on the desk, tap on the bit of paper you're doing it on. So you've now gone through the process of, of something very simple, your dominant hand, something a bit more challenging, signing your name with a non-dominant hand. Then back to your dominant hand with something to distract you on the bottom left and then on the bottom right here, signing your name with your non dominant hand and then tapping on the table with your dominant hand. Now, doing this, if you have done it, it gives you a very strange range of emotions. So in the top left, when you sign your name with your dominant hand, it's very simple. You know, it's not a complex task. It doesn't require much brain power. Uh, it doesn't challenge us whatsoever. In the top right, it is quite challenging to sign our name with our non-dominant hand, but it is manageable and it's achievable. So it gives us a sense of, of challenge and difficulty, but it's not something which is impossible. In the bottom left, again, there's a sense of challenge. It really requires you to engage your brain, but it is possible. And then in the bottom right, when you are doing something with your non-dominant hand, whilst thinking about something else, it makes you feel completely inferior, unable. So. What I'm getting at here is if you put yourself in the, in the eye of a learner, certainly for me in a sports setting when I'm coaching, is that I never want to program anything that puts people's mindset in that top left bracket because I never want to make things too easy or too simple that they don't have to engage or they're not challenged and pushed. Similarly, on the flip side of that, I would never want to put anyone in this bottom right situation where they don't feel like there is a route to success and they don't feel like there is a route to achievement or development. So it's always thinking about what is achievable but challenging. And I think that failure sits within the top right and the bottom left quadrant, because if we are programming such instability that people don't feel like there's a route to success, then that that's not failure. That's that's the fault of someone else. Failure is part of the process to achieving something which can forms in that bottom left and top right situations. So and the way I want to look at it looking at this is is from an individual and a team perspective um having grown up playing team sports for me it's always been about actually how can a team support one another rather than just an individual um and it comes down to two different strands within that that a lot of people use the phrase teamwork to define what excellent sports teams do uh, and my personal view is, is they, they've misused that word because what we perceive as teamwork such as a football team scoring a brilliant team goal or an F1 team uh, doing a really quick cockpit, ch a, a really quick change in the pit lane. That actually it's a combination of people being able to do their tasks at an exceptionally high level and people being able to work together to do those tasks synchronously. So task work 
for me refers to you know what a team is doing and teamwork is how they are doing it and this is the difference here is that there's a range of different actions that allow people to work together so me understanding the personality of the person who works with me or around me not understanding what their role is because that's probably their specific role but understanding how i can help work with them achieve their role so task work in sporting context i would naturally talk about is related to the goals of the team the principles the style of play uh, the strategy that we try to use and teamwork is very much uh, how we work together what the relationships of the team members are how they understand their role how they understand how they can help each other achieve their roles now, I think this is one of the big difference in individual failure from my perspective and working within a team is that we have people to help us achieve what we want to achieve. So I think it, it's pertinent to think about, you know, who are the best teams in the world? Uh, and a lot of people come up with, you know, in a hockey context, Belgium, who are the world champions, the, the Dutch women who are the, the world champions. We talk about the New England Patriots. Uh, we talk about the, the Ryder Cup teams. We talk about the All Blacks. People mentioned Leicester City when I asked them this question a lot, that they had amazing team work in order to win the Premier League a few years ago. Talk about the, the Chicago Bulls. I'm sure some of you watched The Last Dance early on in lockdown. And then Man United of the 90s, who won that historic treble. You know, when I ask people who are the best teams in the world, these are their, their common answers. And I think that often it's because they look at the output and they haven't gone down into looking at what the two strands are. All of these teams are able to execute their role to an outstandingly high level and are also able to do it together and have understanding of what each other brings to it. So I personally think that to really understand failure and how we learn from failure that we need to think outside the box. So I say to people a lot in a coaching set, you know, we are coaches, not players. So we have the responsibility of bringing things from other domains back into our own domain to really develop them. So looking at Navy SEALs who uh, have you know one of the most dangerous jobs but have to have tactical approaches and understanding of their each role within a team and then at the same time have to be able to work together and communicate in high pressure situations lots to learn from there pilots who have so many processes to manage instability or problems mid-air when they have the lives of thousands of people in their career in their hands Similarly, surgeons who work into a tiny space in outstandingly high pressure. And one thing that I find interesting is that quite often surgical teams don't know each other. And actually they, they get thrown together based on who is working at any one time. Well, actually the, the, there's an understanding of task there and an ability to work together as a team based on certain processes. Things like the red arrows where any mistake would ultimately be catastrophic. And then I think the one I mentioned earlier there, F1 pit crews, who I just think are absolutely fascinating because the speed that they are able to execute at is absolutely sensational. But at the same time, they will experience failure a lot. And they, whilst we see on the television often them excelling and getting it right, we can also watch like we did on Sunday where they make an error. Um, and there's so much to learn here about failure and how the, these teams use failure as part of a learning process rather than as the end result. And I popped a Rubik's Cube up here but, and a lot of people would say, what's the link? Now, for me, sport is very different to academia. Academia for me uh, is very process driven. And once you've found out what you need to achieve, there is a route to get there. Sport is very much about solving the puzzle. Uh, and I would say to all of my teams when we play that every single time that you step on the pitch or you're confronted with a different uh, tactical approach from an opposition, that you have to solve the Rubik's Cube. And that's essentially what you're trying to do every time. You just have to find a way to solve the problem. There are multiple ways to solve a Rubik's Cube. There's multiple ways to interact as a team on a pitch in order to get to a stage where you excel. And anyone who's tried Rubik's Cube, you will try and try and try and you will get it wrong. And then you'll come back to it and come back to it again. And it's all about finding the way to succeed. So where this has led me to um, this appreciation of you know my, my own experiences of failure and then trying to work out that it's a really positive thing is that when I coach I will always try and plan for it so as much as I can it, it's a case of planning in when there's going to be challenge and also planning in when there's going to be success and being able to make sure that players experience both and that there's always a route from the failure to the success and all of these groups you see on here, are, they will hunt in packs. 
they will work together in order to to survive in the wild and um, there are similarities with this to what we will do in a sporting context every day in a team that when it comes to um pack animals hunting for food certain people will take the leads based on their characteristics some will be really aggressive and forceful and they'll be sent out to to find a way to, to prey on an enemy some will be a bit more cunning they will also form a really important part in the team and that all of these will hunt together much similarly as that we have to hunt together in a sporting context to try and find a way for success and again it's solving that rubik's cube every single time that how is the best way to solve the problem to learn from failure and to then program success and one of the things that's so impactful in sport is you know we talk about connections it's one of my least favorite words but a word i hear an awful lot is people talk about oh we don't have enough connections on the pitch or i wasn't connected enough to my team but you know what are we actually connected to and, and, and the image hopefully portrays that when, when we play team sport so when we play hockey context everyone watches the ball there's 22 people on the pitch at any one time and all they are watching is the ball but stats have come out saying that actually a hockey game would be 70 minutes at a club level the, the average player would spend 90 seconds on the ball in a game so a minute and a half out of 70. now instead of connecting with the ball which is a lot of people make the mistake of and that can often be uh, to bring it into a real life context connecting with the end result of something you know we have to ask ourselves a question what are we doing the rest of the time that will give us that end result because of your 90 seconds on the ball how have you prepared for it how have you um, interacted with your team over the other 68 and a half minutes that's allowed you when you get on the ball to make a really positive impact on the game rather than a negative one so it's all about what we are connecting to and how we engage players in the game when they're not on the ball the best teams are the ones that are still working together cohesively when they're not actually on the ball so to try and pull this together into a bit of a, a team setting uh, my beliefs would say that you know that there are lots of things which impact on the team functioning and performance and part of that comes from the individual relationships that people have with one another and that will be coach to player that will also be a player to player on the pitch the understanding of individual tasks that they have to have as part of their role and then the actual common ground and, and shared values and, and principles of a team that people can send to the decision making around so all of that goes into the pot and if that is done successfully then out will pop hopefully team performance after that process has taken place but within that to put this down into three things there's going to be masses of failure there's going to be masses of mistake that we have to cope with because tensions are going to get high and that's going to impact on relationships and people are going to be in the wrong place or find themselves in an unfamiliar position uh, in many sports when you know the, the center defender has ended up at left midfield just because of the way the game has gone do they understand the role of that position that they have to now do and then thirdly when when people get so caught up in the game and pressure situations that they forget about the team strategy and intuition takes over so there are so many times that this could fail and this is why the uh, the, the planning and the preparation of a team cannot be so linear and it can't be comfortable it has to be a little bit chaotic and it has to program in some scenarios where things are difficult and you have to program in times where relationships will be tested and you have to program in times when and role clarity will be questioned because people are out of position and in an unfamiliar situation uh, similarly you would have to be prepared for someone gets sent off which you know I, i'm always fascinated watching football matches the weekend when when there's a red card and then there's a, a conversation for four or five minutes on the sidelines seeing all the assistant coaches who almost look panicked but my psyche would say why aren't you prepared for that why haven't we actually planned for that and know what we're going to do in that situation so just to give an overview of, of what I mean by all the connections is that, you know, in hockey, if we all watch the ball, that at any point there will be one person in a team in possession of the ball or right, the way that the game works. And if uh, if all that we do is focus on the ball carrier, then we have the ball carrier in possession of the ball and looking for individual players around them. You've then got all the players around them looking individually at the ball carrier so we're just working in, in small subsets of two players and then if all we then have is the ball carrier connecting with a person on the left a person straight and a person right that as soon as the ball is passed let's let's say it ends up the person on the right hand side 
then there are no connections available. And that whole process has to start again, because if all we're ever doing is connecting with the ball, then we're actually making an error before we even begin, because we're not working as a unit, we're not working in cohesion, and that is failure. So from a coach's perspective, it would be remiss to think that this is a positive step. And in reality, this is, you know, failure from the coach. And failure can come in so many different guises, and this would be in a planning perspective. So the way that I would reframe is that if what we try and focus on is, is the ball carrier connects with all the people around them, so the person the ball is looking for support on their right, support straight, and a support on their left. And then instead of all of these players connecting with the ball carrier, that they connect with each other. And they try and form shapes on the pitch with each other. Now, I will always talk about a triangle of support when I coach because I try and uh, make people aware that they will intuitively know where the ball is. The way that the game flows, we will always know where the ball is in a game of hockey or a game of football or even a game of rugby. That it's all about connecting with those around you. So we leave the person on the ball to make a decision. But if we offer situations where players off the ball connect with each other rather than just the ball carrier, then what we can find is that there's multiple options. And then what then occurs is that if the ball were to go to the player on the right hand side, because there are already connections between these players, then the response will be quicker to offer the next pass. So when I talk about connections, this would be what I mean. And again, this is programming success to avoid failure because as soon as the ball is gone, we've already got the next option rather than having to restart the process. These are um, these are two of my favourite photos. And, and the reason that I ask, uh, that, that I pop this up, and the reason this links to, to failure for me is that as coaches and as educators, we have to be prepared for both of these situations. On the right hand side, and this is a this is a young lad who is who is at the, the school I work at, he plays for Scotland under 18, he's an absolutely outstanding young player. He is uh, performing the right hand side on an aerial scoop, so basically a lifted pass through the air, probably one of the most complex skills within hockey. So this is him at his peak, this is when his confidence is at his very highest, he's absolutely flying. And from a coach's perspective, you're trying to pull him down off the ceiling so that he doesn't get too emotional in that situation. And then the left, this is after a loss in the semi-final of, of the National Cup. And actually he's crestfallen and he's absolutely heartbroken. So I have to know enough about him to be able to pull him off the ceiling when he is at his highest and is more confident and also pick him up off the ground when he is in that situation where he's so devastated. And I think that people often neglect the role of relationships here because it would be a failure for me if I wasn't able to manage him when he was at his best. And similarly, it'd be a failure for me if I wasn't able to help him when he was at his lowest. And this is the impact of relationships on actually what we do. But when we think about that, I will know with that individual actually what the right approach is and, and that's very much the role of the coach or the role of the educator is, is to work with the people around them to figure out what's the best route to success um, and to figure out just how I'm going to get to the end result and because everyone's different we have to find different ways so in a sports context we might have 18 people in a team uh, on a Saturday and then I have to know what each and every one of those individuals needs at any given time to try and help them so it might be sell tell shout coach preach teach and um, now one of the problems with that is i'm not on the pitch so as a coach i can prepare players as best i can but the second they step over the white line it's very much up to them and they have to make really good quality decisions so one of the difficulties attached to that is that just having this knowledge between coach and player and similarly player to coach isn't enough and I get frustrated and I would love to hear some opinions at the end when people talk about the coach player relationship and in reality that's not enough what we really want is player to player knowledge of all of this information that a player understands how to pull that person down off the ceiling when they're at their best and also to pick them up in the heat of the moment when they are struggling because if as players we are prepared for that then coaches don't have such a role which is what's it is critical, but they don't have a role which they can't actually execute on the pitch. Because if someone beside you who's playing in the heat of battle with you during a game understands how you operate and notices that you are struggling, then they can help solve that. So programming failure is actually programming situations into training uh, for me or programming over a period of time so that players can understand this. 
and players start to understand how people operate uh, mm -hmm. under different stressors and actually who do we want on the ball in certain high pressure moments and who do we not want on the ball and who needs more support when times are tough and who needs a pat on the back when they're struggling or who needs just a bit of a bollocking to help them get better and the more that we can get this from player to player the easier it then becomes and that all leads down to role clarity so when it comes to sport Many of you will have seen this before when we look at insights profiling, which will tell you about the type of personality that somebody has. So this is a free one I've done online uh, and it would tell me that I'm a little bit red yellow. So I'm, I'm very much results driven, but I'm quite positive uh, and easy to get along with. I would say sometimes, not all the time. Um, but these just give a little bit of background around why people are as they are. And, and we this is a process that's done with, with national squads. And what it really helps you with as a coach is if someone's very blue, they love detail um, and they love to know why they are doing things. And um, you can have very kind of complicated conversations with them that they'll really enjoy the data as part of it. Whereas if someone's yellow, they just want to know the answer. They just want to be told what to do. And if someone's red, they want to win. And if someone's green, it's all about making sure that people around them are happy. So what you will have in a team is balance and you will, you'll want numerous different types of personality because the last thing you would want is is just the living people on a pitch any one time who are fiery red and want to win because you'll have no one who's thinking of the big picture. Similarly, you wouldn't want everyone who is earthy green because you would have a very different outlook. So again, when we talk about failure, planning for failure is, is knowing my players and knowing the people who operate in that team to work out combinations that are right. And also, so players understand that as well. So they understand who is going to be good in a conflict and, and who's not. So, and this is something which is in the, the book Leadership, uh, sorry, um, the book about the All Blacks, which is really interesting about being redhead or bluehead. And it very much links back to the insight situation. You know, we want people to be bluehead. Apologies, my watch is talking to me. We want people to be bluehead in, in, in situations where it's a bit more complicated. We want people under pressure to be loose and expressive. We want them to be accurate. But we will also have people who have that red head and we can't stop that. So one thing that I do a lot is uh, as I try and categorise people into two uh, distinct areas. Now, I take in criticism for this and, and I appreciate why, but I'll explain why I also do it, is that we have two different types of players, red circles and we have the blue squares. And you'll see the description there that these people who are blue squares, they love structure. They love to keep things simple. They, in a, in a hockey sense, they love to pass the ball. They love to, to minimise their touches. They really take great pride in making sure that the ball is trapped perfectly and is played onto the front stick of their teammate. Uh, and position in, in a defensive system or an attacking system would be really important to them. The red circles couldn't really care about that sort of stuff. They're a bit more maverick. They're quite creative. They will make loads of turnovers because they'll want to try things. Um, but at the same time, they can also win the game and they can also break the game and create opportunities to score. So again, we want a combination. We wouldn't want a team full of blue squares. They would be boring. They would pass sideways and backwards all the time. They would never take a chance to go and score. But we would never want a team full of red circles because they would be so poorly organised. They'd be terribly um, organised in terms of their positional awareness. They wouldn't ever be able to keep the ball for long enough to create a chance. And they'd probably get really wound up at each other. So similar to that, red circles will get very annoyed at blue squares because they won't take a chance. And then the blue squares will get very annoyed at the red circles because they won't, uh, you know, won't, won't, they turn the ball over too easily. And it's finding the happy medium. And for me, making sure players understand where they sit. And just because they're in that, it also makes it easier for me as a coach. So anyone who's a red circle, I'm really trying to work with them to bring a bit more structural intent into their play and a bit more understanding of their position and their and the impact of their decision making. And people who are blue squares, I'm trying to tempt them to pass forward a little bit more. I'm trying to tempt them to take a few more risks so that anyone who's in a red circle, we're, we're pulling them a little bit more towards the middle. So they have some tendencies where they can be a bit more of a blue square. And somebody who's a blue square, we're pulling them a bit more towards red. So they have this balance of of uh, expression and creativity at the same time as being accurate and on task. And then this is just a little bit of feedback from one of my players, which, which I think links to it really nicely, is that, you know, he's talking about an under pressure, how, you know, learning how your teammates tick, knowing how they will um, operate, knowing who will get stressed so that things become second nature in a game situation. 
and then he also it's nice to know when players uh, feed back about things that you have seen before so this whole idea of the blue square and the red circle principle of how that actually helps and who you want on the ball who's going to be a bit more volatile who's going to make really poor mistakes under pressure so need calm down and for me this was great feedback to see because it means that player to player they're starting to understand each other and that any intervention we put in to assist that is going to be really powerful so identity is a really big part of this and i'm just going to flick through this um this part and i will send on my slides after uh, if anyone wants to see them is that we talk a lot in a sporting context about principles so i'm um, playing principles for me uh, impact decision making because they are a way that when we discuss them and create um, understanding behind them that they can inform how a team plays and how people will act in certain positions. So if we talk about playing to space being one of our principles, and this is a on the left hand side of school, uh, the principal cycle we use at school, and this is one on the right we use with um, with the national program, that it starts to inform how we will use our language and how we will look to operate in certain situations. And then with teams, we will try and bring it to life. So this is the difference in a girls first team and a boys first team at my school who have slight tweaks and slight differences beside what they agreed was how they were going to operationalize these principles. Now, for me as a coach, this is really useful because it means I can flick between uh, both teams quite easily and know what they're going to do. But at the same time, this is about them understanding that. So failure to them is a pickup which doesn't have their first touch going forward in the boys. And the difference between that and our girls is slight, but first touch always goes forward with the boys team and the girls were focused on being on the move in every pickup so whether that was forward backwards sideways it different so it's about finding an identity that they all agree with and they all share in so that they can actually work hard together so this is where the task links back to the team this is what they will try and do and then the key thing is then trying to get them to work together and then we will do that through multiple ways we use a lot of whiteboards and um, this will have been during a session in, in the middle where we were looking at being aggressive in possession out of possession and um, their job was to, to fire up words that they thought about and then you'll see circles around some of them which uh, the more that they became apparent to them the more that they would then go back to the board and, and circle that thinking actually this is one of our key words it's one of our agreed words so it's just trying to find different ways to put things over and then similarly on the right here this is a team talk so this is a first team boys team talk um and all that happened was uh, the principal sheet was on the board when they arrived in the change room and this is their work and this is their writing so that they've been talking about in, in different colored pen before we even started looking at getting um, a team talk set up and then similarly this is a girls one where uh, when players came off the pitch they were already starting to, to code themselves and how to get on and they were writing messages for each other so keep posting up a movement when you come back towards the ball um, and that was towards a certain player so this is very much where identity comes to the fore so when we're actually doing this it comes back to you know how are we picking teams how are we actually planning in this instability and this failure so I ask myself a lot, who do I want to put together? Who are the people that don't work well together on a Saturday um, or in a match play situation and, and who really you know, don't work well under pressure together? Well, we'll throw them in a team together and create a scenario where they have to start working better together. And instead of what I see a lot in sports settings is, oh, we'll just make two teams and play. There's a lot more thought process into it. And when identity comes in, we try and change the identity for them all the time. So our, our teams at school, uh, there's a video these are three um, european club teams there's a video for each of these club teams which describes and shows how they play who they are and um, the type of style how that links to our playing principles and when they play as these teams and they're in these teams they have to try and execute that and there's points attached to it so we're trying to change their identity and get them used to to playing in different ways similarly during sessions you know we will throw at them some of these challenge cards um, which changes how they have to play. So if they're given Germany, who are very known for winning the ball on, on the opposition's left-hand side, their own right-hand side, they have to try and change their game because this is how they now have to play. Or if they're India, who are all about attacking flair and creativity, they have to try and change their game. So we just try and change their identity to put them in different situations. And it links back to there will be big errors when we go into playing as India if a team gets given that card our blue squares will really start to struggle because our red circles will love it but they'll turn the ball over a lot so we start to actually create situations where teams have to emerge in terms of how they work together similarly from an individual setting and and this is something we will do a lot um 
last week we we used Arsenal, who are struggling in the Premier League just now, uh, and and put them in a situation and painted the picture of how they had to play. And they played against Leicester, one team who loves to make passes against another team who are very direct. So it's trying to to find ways to bring to life the way we play and also you know execute different identities, both from a team perspective and then maybe give them an individual card to certain players to try and stretch them. So. And then an another part of it is you know, tactics are ridiculously boring, but at the same time, we don't want people to fail when they go on the pitch, because if I pop a player on the pitch and they don't understand their job, then the other players around them are going to you know, suffer as a result of it. So it's how do we put the point across in a different way? How can I program failure in a situation where we can solve it? So, you know, we use Subutio um, because now we can stand over and they can actually help each other. So this is programming in failure before failure actually hits because we can solve problems before they actually emerge and we can check for understanding and that picks up chances where you can then have little conversations with an individual who you might see as quite withdrawn or you can see in their facial expression that they're unsure, you can actually go in and assist and help. And then, you know, similarly using pictures. Um, this is a brilliant example of by the orange team here of defending their circle. So we will program in a situation where here's what we want to look like as a best practice example and then show a picture of our kids okay what's the difference so how do we take it from failure to success as part of the journey and then i suppose the last thing uh, that i want to talk about and, and i'll fly through it because i know i'm running out of time here is is actually how we prepare these teams for failure and planning for that process so um I will always split uh, any coaching I do into three distinct blocks. You have your exploration phase where you're you're trying to, to pick up a new skill or a new tactic or a new idea. You then have a process of fine tuning that and then it gets to the stage where you've integrated it and you understand it to a stage where you can actually perform it. And this is a model that, that the FIH, the Federation of International Hockey use. So when you're exploring, you're going to develop lots, you're going to try different things and you're going to get it wrong a lot. So your success is down. And then when you get to the performance stage, you aren't going to try as many new things because you're comfortable with it, but you can actually use it. So it brings you a lot of success in performance. So the impact of that is how you plan that in. So how you plan in failure, which is the exploration, and then also challenge something so we can do it to successful standards. So this is uh, this is our, our school, our school blocks just now. So um, the season is split into three chunks of exploration, fine tuning and performance. And then each of those blocks is then split into the sub blocks. So right now we are in the final, the final week of our um, fine tuning, fine tuning block. All right. And then they will finish next week and then we will come back after Christmas and we'll go straight into this challenge block to see exactly where they're at. So this means that on a Tuesday they might have a session which is all about developing and exploring and trying things. On a Thursday, we're, we're then trying to fine tune it. So we're changing the way that the coach interacts. We're changing the way that feedback occurs. We're making the standards higher to try and um, execute to get them to that standard. And then when it comes to a Saturday, which is the game day, that's all about performance. So we have to try and take something very, very quickly between each of the weeks in the block and then into the game situation on a Saturday morning where we can explore something, fine tune it, and then be able to execute it. And it's really important that we, we were never going to get that in one session. So we have to plan in that failure. So I know on a Tuesday, which is today, that what we're doing on counter-attacking uh, with our two first teams, they're going to get it wrong a lot. So my behavior has to link with that. And I know there's going to be lots of failure. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And on Thursday, there's going to be less failure because we're going to program in less instability. And it might just be actually directing people into some situations where they're struggling a bit more and trying to engage a conversation with them. And on Saturday, it's OK, can we get to a stage where we can actually perform this? And then if we look at this, this chunk over the season, what we'll then see is how it changes for the players and how their mindset changes and actually also how we can check for learning. So um, what, what we will do quite a lot to actually support this is you know, use time at the start of the sessions to prime our players. And this is probably where failure hits the most, is that um, something we do sometimes is, is we give a team, a team of five, say, uh, the first 500 digits of pie. And their job is as a team to try and memorize as much as they can. So player number one has to say the first number, then number two, number three, number four, number five, then back to number one. And they have to go all the way through. And it's about 
working out how they can chunk down their tasks into a manageable and achievable thing. So instead of worrying about everyone else's number is, they know when their number comes and they know who it's after and they know who it's before. So they just have less to think about. And we will sometimes prime them with this so their mind is already thinking in a struggle zone so that we can then get them into play. And then that might form part of some form of um, game-based activity where they do it beforehand. So, and similarly, we, we will also look at it because failure doesn't just have to come through the actual exercise that we're doing in terms of sport. It can also come uh, as part of the breaks and how we use the breaks. And so quite commonly, we, we will give uh, give players a challenge, which will happen in their in their breaks. And they might have a three minute rest period. And actually, while they're doing that, they have to get the number challenge, the countdown number challenge to, to as quickly as they can. And whatever time they have left, they have to then go and debrief on their performance. So it is, it's adding in different bits of challenge, which give more time or less time to actually reflect and consider. The numbers. And then the last thing that we really do is, is we'll try and get the players to, to feedback consistently. Because again, if you're programming in failure, they have to have something which they can actually attach themselves to, which brings a, a, a element of consistency. So we'll always use the same form of feedback questions. The players will then know it'll be on a board at the side of a pitch. What did we learn? Are we delivering? What can we manipulate? What's limiting us? Or it might be a different form of questions, but we'll always have them there because that is how we learn from failure. So do we understand what we're doing? Are we missing opportunities here? What could we improve given the above? What are we going to do next? And if we take them through that cycle and they get used to reflecting in that cycle, then the failure that we managed to, to uh, add in can then form a part of improvement rather than that just being a very loose conversation that we give them and it means the coach can then prompt rather than have to direct all the time and then it's just um, learning afterwards is, is that last step in terms of how we debrief and I don't think it's done enough but certainly with with younger athletes we try and teach them the difference between a hot debrief and a cold debrief and how emotions can impact this and actually what do we want to keep what do we want to stop doing what do we want to start doing is, is a common halftime cycle we would use and then then after a game our, our kids do a lot of video analysis and, and certainly our senior international players do a lot of video analysis and um, what are we seeing so what does it mean now what are we going to do because we always try and find a route to take that failure back into a route to success and then it all links back to, to what i showed you a lot earlier on in, in this rubik's cube and the role that that plays it's all about solving the problem and um, failure is just your one attempt at trying to solve the Rubik's Cube, but you want to come up with another attempt and another and another route and another route to try and get to the end. And then just the very last thing is coach, but we, we might play a game which is, uh, you know, if, if you score, you get to stay on. And actually, uh, after a couple of rounds, it's the team who scored the most goals. So you want more time on the pitch, we'll get to go through. And the team who's last at that stage will get destroyed and dismantled. And uh, the other two teams will take your players. So before a session, we might use the pie challenge to, to get them thinking and trying to get them to operate under a bit of pressure because we know that there's going to be struggle as part of that. And we know that they're going to have to, to have conversations in the sideline. And then we'd also maybe remind them of what are the balance of players in your team. So if it's if it's all about scoring early, then we probably really need our, our blue squares to, to play a big role here to make sure that if there's failure from the red circles, we can manage it. And then we would definitely use the, the boards at the side to engage their conversations and we would probably start, if we can see a team really struggling, to, to look at some hot debriefing and try and implement that to help them so that if they're really struggling and failing, that we can get them back on track. And then similarly, we play a game a lot called the 1-0 game. So it's once you score, you have to not concede. And if you make an error in the scenario where you are 1-0 ahead, you have to try and keep the ball and not concede for as long as you possibly can. And that's your way to win the game. So it's about, OK, here you are under pressure you need to not make errors so we're trying to put them under a lot of pressure and trying to create instability so they get a bit ratty with each other and then if the score goes to 1-1 one, one, then we just play again until somebody goes ahead so we would maybe look at how people can adapt going up and down a man recognize who you want on the ball in certain situations who you don't want on the ball how you're going to communicate uh, and we might use a bit of video before it so and um, it's just lots of different ways and this is one of one of my favorites just now is we play three games simultaneously and we're very fortunate at school that we can just play contact hockey which we obviously can't do in in adult levels is that we have three different games going on across three pitches and um, we have two teams 
playing and they it's up to them to split their players between the three pitches and once they've actually split them they can move freely between but the way to win is that you have to be winning on all pitches at the end of play so it's all about them finding ways to communicate working out in play and under pressure who's succeeding and who's not organizing that they can pull people across and um, to try and change their numbers it might be they want to have a 4v2 on one pitch to make sure they can find a way to score so this is all about programming and failure to try and get them to find a way to success and the last thing we'll quite often do is is we'll throw in some scenarios where people have to play in certain situations um that you're one nil up and you've just received a yellow card so you're down a man how are you going to react uh, and we try and again add them into some identity so that they find a way to do it and we try and make that as real life as physically possible uh, you know kids specifically love to try and emulate people who are at a higher level so we'll always try and use international teams or club teams so um i suppose in summary and, and i've flown through that and i hope it wasn't too boring uh, failure is a real opportunity to promote success it's not just about um how you know you fail and what happens it's the process about planning for it which can then engage you in finding positivity and finding developmental opportunities from it and i actually would truly believe that if you're working with um, academics or you're working with sports teams at any level that actually you have to plan in what your failure is going to look like because if we can support people and we can get into a stage where they are going to fail and we know when they're going to fail and we know what it's going to look like then we can support them as best as possible and we'll get the end result we're looking for and if anyone wants to email me or or to pick up a further conversation then um, my contact details are there either either get me by email at school or or catch me on twitter i would love to love to chat yeah, further but if there's any questions um i would love to hear them uh, thank you everyone for coming uh, thank you chris for giving your time to speak to us today uh, this will be available as a recording um, afterward which we'll let students know about um, so yeah thank you very much chris for sharing your experience and your um, interesting thoughts and uh, research and ideas on this on this issue so thank you very much take care everyone thank you very much for having me